Hi guys and welcome back to Duralex Sedlex. I'm Anna and I'll be your host for today's episode on Did the EU fail Poland or did Poland fail the EU with um, Professor Morain. He is a professor here at the University of Groningen and he's going to introduce himself later on. You heard that right, it's just me today. Alyssa is in Amsterdam at the moment um, with her friend and her sister because they came to visit. So um, it's just me today. But yes, in this episode, we're going to be talking about all things Poland, all things about um, the government in Poland at the moment and what they are and actually aren't doing and how that kind of has an impact on um, Poland as a whole. Also, with a similar situation in Hungary, very much going to talk about rule of law violations in both of the countries and also East-Western divide at the beginning, just kind of like showcasing the situation, how everything ended up where it is right now. And we're also going to be diving into media freedom, democracy, judicial independence, LGBTQ and women's rights, especially considering abortions. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoy this episode and I'll see you at the outro again. So the first question that I have for you today is, could you actually please introduce yourself in your own words to the listeners who may actually not know you and what your research expertise is? Yeah, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation. It's lovely to be here. Uh, all student projects are very welcome uh, in, uh, in Groningen, so uh, I hope that you'll have uh, a lot of listeners. So my name is uh, John Morijn. I'm a professor of uh, international uh, law here and also an assistant professor of European law. But I only work about um, two days a week in Groningen. I'm also uh, a commissioner at the Netherlands Human Rights Institute. So basically I'm a judge in equality cases and I'm a member of the advisory council on migration in, in the Netherlands. Uh, and my research uh, at the moment and for a very long time has really been precisely uh, the question that you asked in the beginning. To what extent can the European Union help uh, make sure that each of the uh, EU member states are and remain liberal democracies? Uh, is it doing a good job? Uh, if not, uh, how could it do a better job? Now that's perfect that I got you today for this question. <laughs> so. Um, how would you actually define the rule of law and how do you think it kind of relates to your research in the situation of Poland and also within your two most recent articles, I've read them briefly a few days ago, just to like structure the questions a little bit. Yeah, so uh, I have a wide definition of what is the rule of law. Uh, the rule of law is one of the founding principles of the uh, European Union and the founding principles of the European Union are found in Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union. They include the rule of law, human rights, democracy, uh, rule of law uh, in, in that context um, is really about making sure that there, uh, everybody is treated equally before the law, that uh, uh, there's judicial independence so that judges function in, in the context of separation of powers with other state uh, uh, actors mm -hmm. so that they are not part of the government or not part of the executive. And it's about reliability of, uh, of, of the court system uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that there's a real external arbiter in, in uh, what came out of the, the legislative mm -hmm. uh, process. So these things cannot be seen in isolation from uh, the other values that I just mentioned, human rights and democracy. It's nice to have an independent judge, but if there's no human rights protection, you will have no value in the independence of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. It's also the other way around. You can have, you and me can have uh, all sorts of rights, but if there's no external arbiter uh, who, when it comes to it, uh, will decide impartially. Mm -hmm. So without being involved in any of the interests in the background, it will not really uh, have any value. And it's the same with uh, democracy. Uh, you can have a beautiful uh, human rights protection system, but uh, uh, if, the, if it's not eventually the people uh, who can uh, uh, kick out those leaders that they don't want uh, or they don't like. And we have mm -hmm. all sorts of examples in, in the reality in the world uh, today, of course, uh, then uh, each of these other values has no value either. So these things need to be uh, uh, seen in, in connection to each other. And that's why I'm, when I talk about the rule of law and liberal democracy, I, I talk about all, all of these values combined and how they interlink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very all-encompassing. Yeah, very true. Um, yeah, you already answered my second question because I was going to ask how actually is the rule of law related to democracy, but you had a beautiful explanation to that. Um, so the next question would be, how actually is the judicial system in Poland affected by the country's democratic deterioration? Because you mentioned in your recent article that there's very much this like trend in Poland of democratic deterioration, you actually use those words. Um, just to explain that as well a little bit to the listeners. Yeah, so, you know, the, the basic principle is that a, a judge, judicial uh, judges are uh, both impartial and independent. 
uh, independent means that they're not connected to any, uh, any of the two other uh, state powers. Mm -hmm. So that they cannot uh, be associated with mm -hmm. uh, the executive yeah. or with the legislative. Impartial means that uh, whatever conflict comes in front of you, you treat uh, each side equally. And of course, you eventually have to decide, uh, but you know, that's, that's the basic principle. So what has happened in Poland, particularly since the, the Law and Justice Party uh, came to mm -hmm. power, is that, in fact, they have replaced many of the, 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 the persons who are impartial and independent and therefore judges by people that are actually uh, basically political appointees. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon for the executive to appoint a judge. For example, that also happens in many, many other countries. But the difference is that uh, in other countries that is basically often a, a, just a formality. You have to uh, sort of be rubber stamped. For mm -hmm. example, in the Netherlands, uh, judges to the Supreme Court also need to be approved by parliament. That's uh, just a formality. Mm -hmm. It's just how the, how the procedure is uh, designed. But what is happening in Poland is that, first of all, the Minister of Justice combines two state powers mm -hmm. uh, in himself already. He's both part of the executive and of the legislative. He's both the public prosecutor and the Minister of Justice. So that's already in combining... An overlapping is, bias. Yeah. That's already an overlapping bias. But more importantly, uh, what is now being done is that people who are uh, clearly political appointees, mm -hmm. so where it is clearly expected in what sort of direction they were going to decide any conflict, are now placed in a position where you would normally expect impartial and independent people, which by definition are judges. So what's now happening in Poland, increasingly in all the highest courts in Poland, there's the Constitutional Tribunal and the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court in itself has five different chambers, depending on the subject matter that is under discussion. Increasingly, almost everybody who is now in the, the Constitutional Tribunal that deals with questions about when something is in, in consistency with the Polish Constitution, none of these individuals uh, are impartially independent from the government. Mm -hmm. So that means that legally, I'm not saying this as an activist, but um, I'm saying this as as a way to reflect what the case law of the highest courts in, in Europe say, namely mm -hmm. the European Court of Justice and the, the, the European Court of Human Rights. If you're not impartial and independent, you're not a judge. So mm -hmm. whatever comes out of your mouth is not a judgment. Mm -hmm. It's basically a way for the government to speak through another channel. Yeah. And you see that problem that is sort of uh, like an oil uh, spill contaminating the whole mm -hmm. system of judiciary in Poland. And, and, and the, the genius, let's say, uh, sort of the evil genius of the, uh, of, of the government there is that they started at the top. Yeah. Uh, the reason why that is so important is that in, uh, in, in the legal system, when you and me would have a problem, you'd start at a low court, mm -hmm. you could appeal and eventually you yeah. end up at the highest level. So you only need to capture the highest level to mm -hmm. sort of contaminate the whole system. Mm -hmm. Because if you and uh, me would uh, at the first two levels actually encounter partial and independent uh, people and we would still disagree and would want to uh, go to uh, cassation, for example, we would no longer be guaranteed a fair trial. So yeah. that's why it's so dramatically important in the definition of the rule of law that I gave in the beginning uh, that this is signaled and, and also that something is done about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will, I'm sure that we'll talk, uh, talk about that uh, aspect later. Yeah, of course. So then, do you think that Poland is even able to guarantee those fundamental human rights if the judiciary is not independent? And will Polish people ever receive impartial justice in itself? Very good question, but it's very important to be very specific. 95% of the, uh, the judges in Poland are impartial and independent. Mm -hmm. The problem is in the top. Mm -hmm. But uh, because they're in the top, it sort of contaminates the whole system yeah. in, in all sorts of uh, ways. And to answer your question directly, in my particular, in my personal view, if you capture the top, uh, in at least in theory, it's no longer possible to guarantee a fair trial for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe in most cases there will still be a fair trial because most mm -hmm. cases will not actually go to the highest court, yeah. right? Yeah. If you and me have a have a car accident and we disagree uh, about uh, who should pay the penalty, for mm -hmm. example, and we would bring such a case in front of uh, a court in a remote town in Poland where there's uh, just an independent and impartial person sitting mm -hmm. and we would be satisfied with the result, yeah. we would have had a fair trial. Course, yeah. But uh, uh, the, the question is specifically about the topics that could go up all the way. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, this, this is a, 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 a tricky question also for mm -hmm. the judges in Poland itself. Because if you work in a system as an impartial and independent judge and you know that whatever you're ruling, which mm -hmm. is a judgment, 
is uh, could end up in front of what is a pure extension of what is in fact the government. Of course, you're also going to have to deal with all sorts of strategic considerations that as a judge you shouldn't have to do. So that's mm -hmm. why it's so fundamental to uh, nip this on the butt. Yeah, literally. <laughs> True, because then everything kind of gets contaminated by the top. So then moreover, do you think that the trend of declaring the EU constitution, because like Poland declared the EU constitution is like not compatible with the Polish constitution, all of that happened. So do you think that trend in itself kind of could potentially like spill over into other countries and we could see that trend happening and more maybe Eastern countries that are more prone to that or even spilling over like to the West in quotation marks here? Yeah, so uh, let me first take a few steps back and make the, the yeah. question more specific. It's not Poland that declared it, it's specifically the Constitutional mm -hmm. Tribunal. And the Constitutional Tribunal is one of these highest courts mm -hmm. that are no longer populated with judges. Okay. So it's an extension of the government who mm -hmm. has declared this. Okay. In particular, this specific case was actually brought by the government to ask the so-called Constitutional Tribunal mm -hmm. Could you just uh, sign here, here and here what we actually uh, already think uh, is the right answer ourselves. So it's it's very important to to think of this scenario not as one where a court said something. Okay. It's, it's, it's about uh, how the extension of the government said something. So let me make it more theoretical. Yeah. You suggested in your answer that this is an East-West problem. That's mm -hmm. not the case. Some of the people and uh, uh, your, your listeners will uh, be interested in, in knowing that, in fact, here in, in Groningen we organized a big festival in September where we invited quite a few people from Poland to actually mm -hmm. fight for the rule of law, judges, journalists, uh, NGO workers. In fact, most of the, some of the most courageous people fighting for EU European values mm -hmm. are in the east uh, mm -hmm. of Euro Europe. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the east is bad and, no, uh, no, and, yeah, and the west yeah. is good. I would actually argue that Eastern European citizens yeah. are much more active in defending our values and we are too much too complacent here in the west. That's part of the reason mm -hmm. why, uh, why I am you know, in my role as a professor and in other roles pleased that I can talk to you mm -hmm. about this and more generally talk about this in the media. So this is not an east-west thing, it's about capture by mm -hmm. uh, a government with a populist agenda. Now, imagine that the scenario had been different in Poland, namely that uh, the Constitutional Tribunal is actually still uh, independent, mm -hmm. and the government asks, listen, we're working together with 26 other member states, and uh, we're unsure that what we now uh, are gonna agree mm -hmm. upon or have agreed on is in, in line with the Polish Constitution. Mm -hmm. Could you, as an impartial and independent body, uh, tell us uh, whether this is in line uh, with the Polish Constitution. That's mm -hmm. a completely legitimate discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, each, it's a, uh, in, in, in the legal jargon, we're living in a, in a system of multi-level mm -hmm. governance. So each uh, national legal system is connected to the EU uh, legal mm -hmm. system, but there's also completely legitimate discussion in each of the 27 member states whether uh, the, the way that we are cooperating in the European Union is in line with each of the national constitutions. Now, this is an, uh, not a novel question. Actually, mm -hmm. 60 years ago, when the treaties were negotiated, the whole system uh, was uh, designed to deal with just these type of questions. And that is the, the system uh, in which national courts, if they're unclear about the meaning, for example, of uh, uh, European law in their specific system, they can ask as judges, mm -hmm. so as impartial and independent people, uh, to the judges in, in the European Court of Justice, uh, can you help me interpret uh, European Union yeah. law here? So, within that theoretical context, it is possible, and it has actually happened, that uh, uh, different impartial and independent sets of people, different mm -hmm. judges sitting at the national and the European Union uh, level, disagree. Uh, this has happened, for example, with uh, the Danish Constitutional Court, the Italian Constitutional Court, the German Constitutional Court. And this is a completely uh, natural development that, that's just a, it's called a constitutional dialogue, a multi-level uh, dialogue. But it's very important that I come back to my very first point, mm -hmm. uh, to realize that what's happening in Poland with the Constitutional Tribunal is not in that category, because it's not a court. It's just an extension of, of the government uh, there. So uh, uh, equaling or comparing what's happening in Germany to what's happening in, in Poland mm -hmm. is simply a false equivalence, because different sets of uh, judges talking to each other is something different than effectively uh, the, the, the government taking over all branches of, of government. That's, yeah. that's not the same situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just going back to your first point for a second, because you mentioned that it's not an east-west divide thing and that in the eastern bloc, I want to say, um, people are more almost more activist because they maybe don't have those like rule of law guaranteed fundamental rights, especially in Poland. Would you then say that that is true, that people maybe are 
more active in especially those countries that are more deprived of what we maybe have in like the West and that we are more comfortable almost in what we have and I don't really realize what we have. If that um, kind of makes sense. I don't know if I really yeah, phrased that really I, I, weird. I, I understand. I understand what you're trying to say. It's not only Poland, it's also Hungary, it's mm-hmm. also Romania, it's also Bulgaria. I think that uh, you're likelier to step up to the plate mm-hmm. as an NGO or uh, anybody who is in any way involved in guaranteeing the rule of law as I had defined mm-hmm. it in the beginning when it's under pressure. Mm -hmm. Uh, And at the moment we see it's more under pressure. For example, when you look at all sorts of international rankings, uh, and there is a sort of an east-west divide in in that the Western European Union members are ranked a little bit higher in these rankings than the east. That's not a surprise. I mean, it's because of the the tradition uh, being a little uh, younger. Mm -hmm. Uh, But my, my main worry is not so much it may sound paradoxical, and it's perhaps a good mm-hmm. quote for your trailer. My main worry is complacency in the West. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's worrying me more what's happening in, in the East to some extent, because there you see that there's very brave NGOs, very mm-hmm. vocal uh, judges who are mm-hmm. able to articulate extremely well uh, what the worry is and why mm-hmm. it's so in- incredibly important to have uh, judicial independence. But there, there's a, a more general problem that you see that Problems with the rule of law never concentrate just on one aspect. Yeah, it's course. always it's it's not just uh, that you try to restrict uh, uh, judges. You also try to restrict, for example, NGOs. That's mm-hmm. what's happening in Hungary. Yeah. Uh, recently, there was a law in Hungary that said that uh, as an NGO, if you're funded from abroad, mm-hmm. uh, you need to register and make sure that on your website uh, uh, it's made clear that you are actually receiving mm-hmm. funding from abroad. Mm-hmm. The European Court of Justice said this is illegal. It's mm-hmm. a stigmatizing thing. It, it, it also uh, co- contradicts the market because there's uh, freedom of capital that is in this way uh, mm-hmm. being affected. Um, but, but the point I was trying to make is that not only is there a problem for judicial independence or NGOs, but often it's also the media. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the worry is, uh, I, I don't have to worry that um, in, uh, in wherever in Europe there's a problem with backsliding, that there's not courageous individuals mm-hmm. who are able to voice why this is so important. Mm-hmm. The worry is that they no longer have an outlet to actually yeah. uh, have a wide public uh, for this uh, to be convinced by. Mm-hmm. Because if you capture the media, uh, the public mm-hmm. media, the, the, the media funded by taxpayers' money, mm-hmm. and you use it as a propaganda mm-hmm. channel for yeah. your own uh, political agenda mm-hmm. rather than making sure there's different views uh, mm-hmm. made known. Of course, it's much harder for people who are actually fighting for the rule of all, as I've defined it, to find their public. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so uh, that's that's the reason why you also have to have a sort of a holistic uh, view of all mm-hmm. the stuff that is happening uh, in combination and which together constitutes uh, uh, democratic backsliding. Mm, of course, I mean, also with the uh, independent media, we also see that in Hungary, and I'll have a few questions for that later as well, and also we see that kind of in the Russia and Ukrainian conflict, how Russia is kind of very much using their, like, taxpayers' news channels as, like, propaganda to make something out what is not really happening there. Okay, so could you actually... Um, moving a little bit away, like not really from the rule of law, we're still on the rule of law topic, but a little bit away from it. Could you actually elaborate upon a situation because especially in Poland at the moment, many women and LGBTQ people actually face, I want to say threats towards them personally. And kind of could you explain that situation a little bit to listeners who might not actually know what's going on about that? And then also how that is almost a little bit maybe related to the rule of law about fundamental human rights and everything in that kind of context. Yeah, absolutely. It's not just a little bit related. It's an essential <laughs> element of it, simply because of the what I started out in the beginning, the rule of law, human rights mm-hmm. and democracy are all connected. So what often happens with populist governments is that they think in an us versus them. Mm-hmm. And they define the us uh, in the way that is politically convenient uh, for them. So it can be us, the Poles, who are uh, Catholic, who uh, uh, think that uh, our society consists of uh, partnerships that are one uh, man, one Mm -hmm. woman and four kids. Everything that is outside uh, of that uh, norm norm, uh, and which uh, the the woman clearly uh, is in a submissive position to uh, to, uh, to the guy Mm -hmm. is a threat. uh, Mm -hmm. uh, And therefore, uh, we're going to enforce uh, the law. Mm In, in the way that our us versus them works. Mm-hmm. So this has very powerful effects in the Polish society, for example, because everything is explained from that specific norm. Mm-hmm. Because if uh, in your love life uh, you fall for the same sex, yeah. 
uh, you fall outside of that norm and you're part of the dam. And therefore, uh, in, in, the, in the whole rhetoric and, and all the legislative action uh, of, of the current government, uh, you're in the spot where you, got, you get hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's even some uh, municipalities in, in Poland that uh, instructed, uh, constituted so-called LGBTI-free zones. Yeah, a friend of mine told me about that because she was in Poland studying on her Erasmus semester. And she's very much elaborating upon that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's the same from the same sort of uh, uh, political vision. You can also imagine why uh, you would want to restrict access to abortion mm-hmm. uh, because it's a threat to the, that political perception mm-hmm. uh, of society that a woman could be a free thinking yeah. individual uh, uh, who is actually uh, an, an economic and a political force in her own mm-hmm. right and is not mm-hmm. secondary to, to the men. Yeah, and has that power over her body as well. Yeah. In that way, it is very much connected to the mm-hmm. wider uh, topic. But it's important that uh, the different populist governments could could think from a different us versus them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's not always the same sort of pattern almost. No, some countries, for example, think that everybody, uh, some political parties in France mm-hmm. say uh, they are perfectly fine with uh, gay people uh, mm-hmm. uh, and they're also perfectly fine uh, with, uh, with men uh, and women being equal and equally empowered as mm-hmm. long as they're natively French and mm-hmm. white looking. Uh, yeah. And, and not come from Algeria or mm-hmm. Morocco. Yeah. Um, so the us versus them can be uh, uh, defined in different ways, but it has the same uh, uh, yeah. same same type of subversive effect on, on a large part of mm-hmm. your society. And the, the reason why this is important is that in a, a liberal democracy, uh, the will of the majority uh, sets the agenda, but it can only be uh, implemented to the extent that it doesn't mm-hmm. affect the basic rights and the minimum standards mm-hmm. of the minority. It diverges based on the political ideology uh, you have, who is in the majority and the minority. Mm-hmm. But you can never trade away this basic insight that you always have to uh, respect the basic rights of the minority. So you can never go under the bar of uh, protecting LGBTIs. Uh, you can never uh, go under the bar of protecting migrants, mm-hmm. however you define uh, your ideology. Mm-hmm. And that is that part, this protect, uh, ruling by the majority, but protecting minority, the mm-hmm. second part of that equation is often lost by populist parties. Mm-hmm. They basically say, we're the people. For the people, yeah. Uh, we're the people mm-hmm. uh, and we're the majority uh, and our will should be the law. Uh, and. Mm-hmm. And that's also the, the same uh, thinking um, that they reject the separation of powers because mm-hmm. they say, well, it's not up to judges to second guess the will of the people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all of this, uh, although it seems to be separate elements and uh, they're very mm-hmm. much connected in the same problem. And that's why you have to see this as a in a comprehensive manner and uh, sort of try to take that apart in a systematic way. Yeah, that makes very much sense. So. Yes, we also a little bit talked about that already, but um, simultaneously Poland is also obviously very Catholic a country believes that abortion should be not permitted and um, kind of a little bit again just how does this actually affect human rights and how does the EU respond to those waves of protests that we've seen in Poland and many other member states actually since like late 2021 like there's been these waves of protest everywhere around the world just like Amnesty International also had like multiple posts and um, on their website and social media accounts stating like raising awareness almost about this issue because um, many media outlets didn't actually cover it until that sort of like those waves of protest actually hit those countries and then they were like okay media attention for a short span of time but those violations are actually still ha- ongoing and still happening. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just just to go to what actually happened to practice the mm-hmm. constitutional tribunal which I had f- have uh, already explained is not actually a court uh, yeah. in, in Poland pronounced something about uh, abortion, Mm -hmm. but we only have the press release uh, Mm -hmm. uh, so far, uh, I think. Uh, And that created a lot of outcry in Poland, right? But there's also LGBTI free zones, um, and there the European Union really has uh, shown teeth, because in European Union funding, and we're talking specifically uh, about funding to Mm -hmm. uh, regions, structural funds, that's called, Mm -hmm. in, in the conditions on structural funds, it says you can only get that money if you don't violate the basic rights. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, so it's very much focused on the second part of the equation that it's fine to rule by uh, on the basis of the will of mm -hmm. the majority, but you can never negotiate on always protecting the basic rights of the minority. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that second part, uh, the EU uh, executive, the European Commission, mm -hmm. has now said uh, we will simply stop uh, uh, the yeah. cash flow from European funds. And that's what's mm -hmm. happening with these uh, so-called LGBTI-free mm -hmm. zones. And that's why they have now also been lifted. Mm -hmm. So this also, and that's probably, again, uh, skipping to one of your next uh, questions, <laughs> it also shows that pressure works. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. And that uh, we, we should not be only skeptical about what the European Union is uh, and, and can do. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, in, in the media framing, often the successes don't get as much uh, attention as mm -hmm. uh, the, the, uh, the initial problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, that actually was one of my questions later on. Um, but now skipping from Poland to Hungary a little bit, just shifting the focus a little bit. Um, there's also rule of law violations happening in Hungary at the moment. And how is that situation almost similar, but also different a little bit from what's happening in Poland? So in most rankings, uh, so the problem in Hungary started much earlier. In most rankings, Hungary is much lower uh, mm -hmm. uh, than Poland. And in, uh, in some rankings, uh, it's uh, no longer actually qualified as a liberal democracy. Okay. Um, so what's happening in, in Hungary is that uh, uh, the pressure uh, is not so openly focused uh, on, on judges. It's mm -hmm. more implicit, uh, but it's also there that, uh, for example, some of the most important cases are uh, assigned specifically to chambers in mm -hmm. courts that are populated by people that are clearly uh, politically appointed. So it's basically the government asking another branch of the government mm -hmm. uh, to uh, assign here, here and here. But there, uh, the, the issue in, in Hungary has really been uh, focusing mainly on uh, subverting NGOs and subverting the media. Mm -hmm. So there's um, a lot of media outlets and radio stations uh, mm -hmm. have been uh, put on the heavy pressure. For example, uh, mm -hmm. radio licenses not being renewed uh, or uh, um, uh, newspapers, uh, the, the, the financial structure being uh, changed in such a way that uh, the, the government can get, mm -hmm. can get control of that. Uh, so that makes it very diff difficult if you actually live in Hungary and uh, to get access to a balanced sort of uh, view of the world so that as a, as a citizen, as, mm -hmm. a, as a voter, you can make up your own mind. Mm -hmm. uh, they put NGOs under pressure in the way that I explained earlier. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the key issue in Hungary, which is completely different from Poland, is corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, corruption is about 10 times higher uh, in, in Hungary uh, than the, the runner-up mm -hmm. in, in the list of corruption with EU money. Uh, yeah. So it's an absolutely massive uh, problem in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Hungary. And corruption is also a problem that, uh, according to the EU legislator, is a rule of law a problem. Mm -hmm. Because it basically means that money that is supposed to serve uh, the public interest, mm -hmm. taxpayers' money, is uh, uh, not used for the for the general interest, but for the the interest of a uh, of, of a few happy few. Mm -hmm. um, um, and there, uh, you see that also the EU has tools, even mm -hmm. very new tools, uh, to intervene there and basically say that. If there's a risk uh, when we when we transfer money into a member state that has very high levels of corruption, mm -hmm. that this will happen with any money that we will put there in the future, course, yeah. uh, that uh, we uh, close the tap, so to speak, mm -hmm. and we demand that that member state f first fixes uh, the problem. Mm -hmm. So the Hungary and Poland, the pattern is sort of similar, but I would say that in Hungary the stress of the mm -hmm. government to uh, in terms of putting pressure has been different on different mm -hmm. elements. And uh, unlike uh, in Poland, in, in Hungary there's uh, massive corruption with EU money. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in that sense uh, the, the, the situations are really quite different. To be careful in comparing one-on-one -on -one, mm -hmm. uh, Poland and Hungary. It's mm -hmm. a different situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. But also there I'd like to stress also for your listeners, I'm talking about the government. I'm not yeah. talking about the Hungarian uh, citizens. In fact, uh, I've, I, I was in Budapest just last week mm -hmm. uh, uh, to show my support to people I admire in Hungary, people who work for human rights uh, NGOs there. Mm -hmm. uh, and amazing. they do incredible work uh, yeah. to the extent that I wonder what I would be courageous enough uh, in their shoes to do that work. Yes. So. It's very important not to talk about Hungary in general. We're talking about uh, the Hungarian government, the that's government is currently itself, in place. Yeah. Uh, and we as fellow EU citizens should actually help our fellow Hungarian mm -hmm. citizens to make sure that yeah. the values that we have all agreed upon, that are laid down in the treaties that I explained right mm -hmm. in the beginning, apply across the board in each of these member states. And that's our challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very nicely said. So you also a little bit talked about how both in Poland and Hungary, um, you almost like 
kind of close that type of cash flow into the countries in order to like make the countries change and like promote that change to like happen quicker. Also, the EU Commission also suspended like Corona funds or blocked the Corona funds, similar situation. Do you think that this is, you also already like specified that you think it is effective, but do you think it's actually like effective to the extent because um, sometimes when those kind of harsh sanctions do come in place, it actually di like indirectly targets vulnerable people, people who don't have funds to maybe buy certain goods because prices will inflate and prices will go up. So so is that kind of a balance almost like because people were also suffering through COVID and they maybe need the money to support their families, etc. Yeah, a very good question. So I'll take uh, the different elements apart. Uh, first, uh, I gave a few examples of how in the past, uh, 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 indeed, uh, in some situations, for example, with the LGBTI mm -hmm. free zones in Poland and in some situations in Hungary, mm -hmm. indeed, the cash uh, has been demanded back. Uh, but that is, has been done very sporadically uh, mm -hmm. by the Commission uh, so far. And in fact, it's a very new development that both for the specific COVID funding and for all the other uh, EU money that is already in place, and uh, there's a specific linkage made to uh, you only get cash when you uh, comply with the rule of law. Mm -hmm. So that's a relatively new development and I think an extremely powerful uh, and, and a very promising yeah. development. Very true. But you have to you, know, you have to distinguish uh, between on the one hand the COVID funds and all the other mm -hmm. funds. The COVID funding basically is based on massive borrowing by the European Union. Mm -hmm. Normally, uh, the European Union does not itself borrow. It just gets mm -hmm. money from the European uh, member states yeah. and then it redistributes it. For COVID, because it was such a massive crisis, the member states agreed that we borrow about 600 billion euros mm -hmm. uh, together. And each of our member states uh, can uh, ask access to uh, some of the money that mm -hmm. we have borrowed on behalf of all of us. Yeah. But to make sure that uh, borrowing was controversial politically, so it was the political deal that you only uh, uh, get access to that cash if mm -hmm. you reform your economy. Yeah. So you'll probably ask, so what does the economy have to do with uh, the rule of law? Mm -hmm. uh, so the economy uh, is linked to what are called uh, country-specific recommendations. So for example, uh, you will only effectively spend your money if you do have a better digital mm -hmm. infrastructure or, here, or if you reorganize your pension system. But for some member states, the problem is not actually these social uh, policy areas, but it's actually the more structural uh, underlying pattern, mm -hmm. like independent judges yeah. or making sure that you don't have corruption. Now, you, you, you will uh, already have known which two member states that were. Mm -hmm. So the reason why the money is still blocked to Poland and Hungary is not mm -hmm. so much primarily about the rule of law uh, okay. issue. It's about we don't want to uh, give borrowed money to these member states if we are not mm -hmm. absolutely sure that they will spend it mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in a correct way. Yeah. So it's a more of an indirect rule of law. Uh, um, uh, uh, instrument, but a much more uh, general instrument uh, is called the rule of law conditionality regulation, which mm -hmm. basically says you only get cash, and then we're talking both about the normal money and COVID mm -hmm. cash in the future, uh, if you comply with uh, rule of law requirements, which in this regulation are defined as judicial independence, independence of prosecution if there's a corruption problem, mm -hmm. uh, and effective doling out of monies uh, and and there the question will be and the, the european court of justice recently green lighted the legality of that instrument to what extent the commission will already uh, start using that in terms of not only acting when you have already given out the money and try to claw it back mm -hmm. but also proactively doing so by saying that we will only give you money mm -hmm. once you have solved that problem uh, so to get to your last question uh, if you uh, impose uh, such measures, the European Court of Justice mm -hmm. says very specifically this is not a penalty, it's an economic yeah. uh, rationale because we're yeah. making sure that the budget is well spent. But if you impose such a measure, is it not actually the, the normal citizens uh, who mm -hmm. suffer from that and how do you make sure that you prevent that? Definitely that's a worry, uh, but that's the problem with uh, any sort of financial measure that you take. Mm -hmm. Also with economic sanctions, for example, now in, in Russia, yeah. uh, the, the real people in the street will be the ones suffering from them. But in fact, the, in the EU legislation, it's a specific provision that says, even if we would impose such a measure on a member state, we will mm. protect what are called the final beneficiaries. So imagine that mm. you're a farmer in Poland and you're expecting uh, EU monies to come your way. Mm. Uh, but you're... Uh, 
uh, your government does not get that money because they uh, have this specific vision that uh, judges uh, at, the, at the highest level yeah. should not be impartial and independent. Uh, to avoid that uh, you as a farmer uh, are um, the, the victim of that, this regulation lays down that in, in the scenario that uh, the tap is closed, the member state, in this case Poland, is still under an obligation to compensate you mm -hmm. for the monies that you mm -hmm. were expecting. So in, in that sense, it's a sort of a mechanism that uh, will um, soften the fall, let's say. Okay, that's good. Um, so now we talked a lot about financial measures. Do you think there are any other diplomatic means that you can, like not you as a, but like you as the EU could take to kind of like push Poland or Hungary into like the right direction almost? Again, it's very important to use the right language. <coughs> uh, it's not. It's not that the EU is pushing anybody in mm -hmm. any direction. What the only thing that needs to happen is that each member state that decided democratically to mm -hmm. join the European Union uh, makes sure that they did not only comply with the basic values at the time of entry, but mm -hmm. they will continue to do so once they are a member. And that's yeah. what the European okay. Court of Justice has said. So we're only reminding everyone uh, of the promises that yeah. they have made themselves. Mm -hmm. And we have hired the European Union to do that reminding. So are there other tools? Absolutely, yes. Uh, uh, the most important tools are the ones that are the oldest, uh, paradoxically, and mm -hmm. that is simply that uh, in case that uh, a member state violates European Union law, the Commission can sue that member state and bring them to court. That's mm -hmm. also that's what that's happens awesome. quite often with both Poland and, and yeah. Hungary. But the re the, the, my diagnosis uh, is the Commission's actions is that it has been far too little and far too late. Mm -hmm. Um, so what could it have done <coughs> more? Uh, for example, one of the things that we talked about, the Constitutional Tribunal mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Poland, the European Commission has never started the case against Poland uh, for violating European Union law that one of its highest courts is not a court, the okay. Constitutional yeah. Tribunal. It has, uh, it has started a couple of other uh, uh, things that relate to uh, judicial independence in Poland, for example, about that some judges can now be punished for asking a question to the European Court of Justice or for mm -hmm. the content of their uh, ruling. That mm -hmm. they have done, we should. Uh, but uh, there's also a couple of things that, that are clearly violations that are not yet done by the Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, uh, so it's too little in that way yeah. and too late in that way, but yeah. it's also too little uh, in a different way. If you bring a member state to court, it takes about two years for a ruling mm -hmm. to follow. But that's not necessary because as a commission, you can also immediately ask for what are called interim measures. Interim yeah. measure means uh, sort of a, a more speedy procedure, which can result uh, in, 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 in a ruling by the European Court of Justice that saying that we have been brought this case, we need to study this for two years. But in the meantime, you cannot change any facts on the grounds until we have made up our mind. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the Commission has done that very rarely, uh, and now it does sometimes do so. Uh, but this is a very effective, powerful tool that has been very rarely used. And once you then have a ruling from the European Court of Justice, formally a member state is under an obligation to comply with European Union law. Mm -hmm. You see that bo both in Hungary and Poland, even if there's judgment from the highest court uh, in the European Union, the European Court of Justice, they simply ignore that ruling. Mm -hmm. That's also not necessary uh, to happen because it's possible for the European Commission to then go back to court and start mm -hmm. a different case saying that Member State X does not actually comply with this uh, ruling yeah. and we ask for penalties. Mm -hmm. uh, that has now uh, happened once or twice. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, uh, uh, opponent needs to pay a million euro uh, mm -hmm. a day yeah. for keeping intact the, uh, the so-called disciplinary mm -hmm. chamber of the so-called Supreme Court, which is this uh, uh, body of politically appointed people within the Supreme Court uh, that uh, sort of disciplines Mm -hmm. judges uh, who are impartial and independent for their, uh, the content of their ruling. Mm -hmm. uh, so it should do so much more often. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely uh, clear that um, the, the European Court of Justice is, will be prepared to go mm -hmm. along uh, with, uh, uh, with such a request because they have imposed this uh, massive 1 million euro uh, penalty. So the Commission has all sorts of options. Uh, that uh, that will um, uh, be effective. So these 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 I think will be the most important ones. But apart from that, of course, it's important to also uh, use other tools. One of the things that uh, could, for example, be done is uh, support much more openly the NGOs that are under pressure in each of these member states. Mm -hmm. For example, by direct financing of these yeah. uh, NGOs. Uh, 
Uh, what is also uh, could be possible is more uh, uh, open political leadership mm -hmm. uh, for the European Commission to fly uh, to Poland, not to meet the yeah. government, but to meet the judges, because mm -hmm. they're European Union judges. Yeah. To fly to Hungary, not to meet the government, but to meet the NGOs. Simply to make a point yeah. that uh, yeah. it's not up to you uh, to, mm -hmm. uh, to regulate uh, uh, what are also uh, European Union citizens. Mm -hmm. So there's also much more politics possible, and I think that politics, the symbolism of that, is what is now uh, missing, at least within the Commission yeah. and, and the Member States. The European Parliament is very vocal, mm -hmm. but it's not enough that it's only the European Parliament. Yeah, of course. So, in a hypothetical situation, because you said that Poland is being fined now and um, weekly or daily even, um, if Poland doesn't comply and they're just they wouldn't pay the fines, they wouldn't um, they wouldn't change anything, they'd just keep their conduct the way it is now. Do you see any possibility that the EU almost like ends or terminates Poland's membership and almost like kicks Poland out of the EU, like? or even Hungary, would that ever in a scenario, or has that ever happened? Uh, I'll answer that question in various different ways. First, as a black leather lawyer, <laughs> that's not possible. Okay. There's no kick out clause. There's only a clause like what happened with Brexit, is that uh, mm -hmm. uh, as a member state, you ask to leave, and then mm -hmm. uh, you have an extended uh, so a divorce uh, settlement, so to say. Uh, yeah. So that's a legal issue. Uh, yeah. You cannot you cannot kick them out. There is a procedure uh, which is laid down in Article 7 of the Treaty on European Union that says yeah. that if there's a systemic problem with the rule of law in a specific member state, uh, this can be discussed either by the Council of Ministers or by the European Council. And they need then uh, human unanimity minus one to actually mm -hmm. suspend a member state's voting rights. So that's not a kick out clause, but it's it's a, it's a clause by which you can uh, sort of really put enormous pressure on, on the member states saying that uh, if you continue this conduct, you, you will no longer be able to be a full mm -hmm. member uh, and have okay. voting rights. The reason why that uh, does not uh, work at the moment is really very simple. And it's a uh, sort of baffling that nobody thought about it at the mm -hmm. time. But it was never contemplated that there could be a problem with more than one member state simultaneously. Yeah. So what will now happen is that uh, imagine there were a majority of member states, 25 member states yeah. who wanted to do something about uh, Hungary or Poland. And mm -hmm. we used uh, this Article 7 procedure. Uh, Poland can uh, then support Hungary in the procedure against Hungary, and Hungary mm. can support Poland in the procedure against uh, Poland. Mm -hmm. But my most important reaction to your, uh, uh, your, your question is that I would actually think it would be an absolute total failure of the uh, European project course, uh, yeah. if we left behind uh, the fellow Polish and, and, and Hungarian citizens mm -hmm. uh, in that way, because we they would not only be uh, 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 cheated by their own government, but they would mm -hmm. also be cheated by the um, uh, by the institution that was put in place to actually control their government. Of course, yeah. So I think it's completely the wrong frame of mind to mm -hmm. think about uh, how to kick out member states. Yeah. It's make it's it, it's much more interesting to think about how we can up the pressure uh, mm -hmm. uh, to to make sure that it becomes politically much more costly for these governments mm -hmm. uh, to uh, continue on the way uh, that they are now. And I think that there's all sorts of ways to up the pressure, uh, simply for the reason that I explained to you earlier. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of tools, uh, but the dia mm -hmm. uh, diagnosis is that uh, very few of them are used in, uh, in an effective way. So we don't need more tools, we need mm -hmm. better use of the current tools. Yeah, okay, very interesting. As a question, just going on from that, hypothetically, if Poland and Hungary both decided to leave the European Union and they both decided, okay, we don't want to be in the Union, we can't comply with their um, judgments, etc. Um, do you think it would be like almost, is it possible even for them to kind of have their own institution, like both of them going together and forming their own institutional framework like that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's, I and mean, would that be a threat almost? Like would that kind of, yeah, be a threat to the EU in a way? So basically, you're, you're asking me about the scenario of uh, two parallel further Brexits mm -hmm. and, and then the two of these uh, uh, new Brexit uh, members starting their own international organization. Yeah. Well, that would simply be uh, governed by uh, normal conventional international law. Mm -hmm. uh, it, would have it would mean that uh, Hungary and Poland 
would have regained their full sovereignty in the yeah. sense that they are no longer bound by European Union law, and mm-hmm. then they're of course free to do in their cooperation mm-hmm. uh, in, in in whatever way um, uh, they wanted to cooperate. I think that the current uh, events uh, of this week show how frivolous such an attempt would be. Yeah. Uh, simply, for example, that. How can you defend yourself as a small country against uh, a neighboring uh, nuclear power? Yeah, of course. It's absolutely uh, essential, uh, and that will be seen in Budapest and Warsaw as well, to actually cooperate. If anything has become evident uh, from the past week, is that yeah. you're much stronger together. You Get need each other. Yes, 100%. And, and in the EU, we are a bit like family members. Yeah. You cannot do without them. And yeah. sometimes there are tensions, uh, <laughs> and you need to be able to, uh, to to speak about that uh, and remind member states and, and their governments of their past promises mm-hmm. and that some things are simply non-negotiable and that it's not as is sometimes now said uh, in, in, in Polish and in Hungarian media that there's a sort of whole social agenda compulsory put upon uh, mm-hmm. uh, on, on the member states. There's plenty of space for variety. It's not it's not a one size fits all. If you would travel through through Europe as part of your podcast, you would find it surprising how different each of the 27 member states yeah. are. And that is perfectly possible. That's course, actually yeah. part of the reason why we're working together mm-hmm. uh, uh, in the European Union is actually to safeguard uh, that diversity. It's not yeah. an harmonizing uh, a project in that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, the whole motto of the European Union is united in diversity. Yeah. Uh, so the whole framing by, by, by these governments that uh, there's somehow uh, an harmonizing effect and a liberalizing effect in the sense that mm-hmm. uh, there, there's a sort of a Western cultural pattern put on them is, mm-hmm. is simply uh, untrue. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have two more questions for you. Thinking about everything that we've talked about, how can how can member states actually directly help the Polish citizens or how can me and you almost show support for Polish citizens? Because I feel like many people are very much lost as to like this whole situation, how they can directly help or show support. Yeah, I'm very glad that you're uh, asking me that question. I often get asked that question because people say it's nice what you do right and it's nice what you talk about in the media. Yeah. What can I do? Uh, what you can do is... Uh, uh, Donate to NGOs in mm-hmm. each of these member states. Support them uh, in, in that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, support free media in these member states. Yeah. And the reason why that's extremely important is that in both these member states, often the free media are under a tremendous pressure of the of yeah. the government. In that uh, uh, everything that they publish can be challenged in court, which mm-hmm. are called slap cases, mm-hmm. strategic litigation against public participation. Yeah. So if I would. Uh, uh, for example, if I would have broadcasted this uh, um, uh, thing with you in uh, in Poland now, mm-hmm. it's quite possible that I would be sued by the government mm-hmm. uh, for insulting them. That would then uh, result me in having to hire uh, a lawyer. Yeah, costly. So, so, yeah. yeah. So what 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 is happening now to independent media is that they have to reserve a, a sort of a part of their budget for yeah. lawyer costs. Yeah, just in case. Yeah. Almost, so it's yeah. very important if you want to do something, even if it's just uh, five euros a year or ten euros a year, whatever you can afford. Uh, uh, donate to these uh, uh, independent media uh, yeah. because they're often crowdfunded and they're yeah. actually uh, very good. Donate to these NGOs. Uh, donate to judges associations mm-hmm. and you know uh, get in touch with the students who are organized our rule of law festival here yeah. in Groningen and, and make sure that uh, you uh, you organize it about the country that you uh, feel passionate about or organize people that uh, to, to speak with people as a, com- a student community to uh, uh, you know inform yourself mm-hmm. uh, it's not my purpose at all as a professor to uh, 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 to um, to to try to convince you of my 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 own convictions. My yeah. my purpose is to uh, uh, to make you a, a critical, smart European yeah. citizen. And the only way you can do that is talk directly to the people who are concerned. Inform yourself uh, and uh, make sure that you understand uh, what's going on and why it's important to you. Uh, mm-hmm. Because eventually this will also affect uh, you. Uh, It makes a difference to your life uh, whether Hungary and Poland uh, remain uh, Mm -hmm. a part of the European Union. Yeah, of course, of course, it affects every single one of us. Um, So just as a last question now, um, do you actually do any research right now? Do you have any like almost open positions or anything that maybe students can get in touch with you about something 
Um, and where can they find you? How can they contact you if you do have that sort of opportunity? Students can always contact me and I'm always uh, on the lookout for smart people who want to work uh, with me on, uh, mm -hmm. as a student assistant. Uh, I, I sometimes have uh, uh, students uh, who, who help me, for example, with mm -hmm. research of, on, um, uh, on, on articles. Uh, but there's plenty of ways uh, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, deepen your knowledge if you uh, think that uh, uh, just the homework uh, that you get in the assignments are insufficient. You can organize a festival uh, mm -hmm. to make uh, for the last time some promotion for that. But you can also uh, do all sorts of other things, uh, you know, volunteer for an NGO, yeah. uh, it's extremely important. Uh, you can also volunteer for an NGO here in, uh, in, in the Netherlands and that will widen your perspective in the sense yeah. that, uh, for example, if you work as a volunteer in an asylum seeker center here yeah. in, in the north of uh, the Netherlands, it will uh, en enrich your experience of what mm -hmm. it means uh, to uh, to live in a liberal democracy and uh, make make you a better citizen and, mm -hmm. and therefore uh, you know not only a, a, a proud graduate of the <laughs> University of Groningen but uh, you will also learn a lot from it and it will and it's you know at the end of the day it's also just fun. Yeah, very true. Thank you very much, Professor Morijn. Thank you very much for my being pleasure on the podcast. So guys, that wraps up today's episode. So um, I hope that you really enjoyed it and got some sort of feel for the topic. If you'd like to go deeper into Poland and Hungary and the um, human rights and rule of law violations that are actually happening there at the moment, then we have some sort of additional resources linked and also where you can donate to independent media and NGOs, um, as we were talking about in this episode today. So um, we're going to have that all linked in the description. You can find us on Apple Music, Deezer, Spotify and also on YouTube. If you have any feedback for us or anything that you'd like to hear on sort of any topics that are EU related or law related, international relations related, send us a DM on Instagram or send us an email at duralexsedlexpod. Um, that's one word, duralexsedlexpod. Um, or leave us a writing on Apple Music or Spotify. Thank you so much for listening this week and I'll see you in two weeks. Bye. Thank you.